The sailing ship Heraclitus is halfway through a five-year expedition around the world. Honey, go neutral. Neutral, on. It's visited by Gay at frequent intervals. The crew of nine are all volunteers, unpaid, including Klaus, the captain. Try to keep it tight. They have reached the Indonesian island of Bali. Like so many tropical islands, Bali is fringed by coral reefs. The reefs protect its shoreline from the ravages of the ocean, the Arizona desert in America. Biosphere 2 was a glass arc which mimicked our Earth. Gay was one of eight who sealed themselves in. There was a miniature rainforest, desert, savanna, and a miniature ocean, which was Gay's responsibility. I had been given the greatest gift of my life to be inside Bias for two for two years. It was stunning. And Gay came out of the experiment realizing there was more variety of life on the reef than in any other area of the ocean. So coral reefs may be as valuable to our planet as the tropical rainforests. Yet surprisingly little is known about them. The coral reefs were going unnoticed. They're hardly, uh, they, we don't even know where they are. There's no map of coral reefs. It's really shocking when you think about it. Just because they're underwater, no one knows what's going on on a worldwide basis with coral reefs. And they could be the most critical, important ecosystem on our planet next to the rainforest. With the aim of monitoring and, for the first time, mapping all the coral reefs around the world, Gay set up a non-profit-making trust. It chartered the Heraclitus as a research base. Okay, good morning everyone. It's the 18th of March, 9th. Paid, including Klaus, the captain. Try to keep it tight. They have reached the Indonesian island of Bali. Of March 98, calling team today. I prepare lunch, do my producer duty and the In the morning I'll finish the candidacy of 1997. And in the afternoon I rinse the course and... I'm inputting the health and vitality results. I'll be going with Klaus and laser on... and generator. I am doing weekly maintenance and preparing... This afternoon we'll be doing the transect. Anything else? Yes, we sell... And in the afternoon, I rinse the course and I'm inputting the health and light. ...which is highly sensitive to changes in the quality of water and sea temperature. Different species react very differently to change, so it's important to know just what's down there. It's not easy. Yeah, I think I saw one. We have to be very careful differentiating some of these parietes with the Montipora. In the pictures, it looks exactly like some of the Montiporas. And they both have these yeah. tiny polyps. Justine, the chief scientist, together with Christine, expedition leader, are responsible to Gay for carrying out the science. They have lived on board for many yeah. years, true sea people. Do you have a radio? Yes. Radio check done? Yes. Of the crew of nine, five are trainees paying for a unique learning experience in seamanship and science. GPS, batteries, mm -hmm. You got it? Yeah. Was that okay last time? There's a planning meeting before every dive. The search started to come in, so I was going like this. It doesn't matter, we have plenty of time today. Mm -hmm. Today they've heard they'll have to contend with a strong current. <laughs> The camera starts in the same place and then the coral ID starts in the same place because once the lines are off, the chain's not holding the pipe right. and if there's a lot of surge, it starts to move and it pulls itself out from underneath the chain. Following an established procedure, they mark off an area and lay a chain carefully along the coral in a straight line. The 
really don't know that much. We don't even know how much coral reef there is on the planet, and we don't know where all the coral reefs on the planet are located. We don't have any good maps of where the reefs are. Let Underwater research. The photographic image sent by satellite is digitized. A computer can then be taught to read the colors and correlate the image with data gathered by the Heraclitus on the CDs, revealing the extent and condition of corals around the world. So if you will, you can take a camera and look through the curtain of air and then the curtain of water and you get a direct shot from space to reef and map for the first time the visual image of where are reefs, what do they look like, where are they, not just some anecdotal observation or depth sounding observation, which we have today, which is a very gross uh, way of mapping a, a system like a coral reef. On this expedition, the Heraclitus has sailed the Indian Ocean from the Red Sea to the Indonesian archipelago. The crew have seen some marvelous reefs, but they've also been alarmed by the amount of damage and degradation. Do you have any thoughts on, uh, uh, on an overall scale, how healthy are the corals you're seeing? Where there are people living near the reefs, the reefs are more damaged, less healthy, less vital, less vibrant. Have you seen any devastation of bombing, um, either cyanide or actual dynamiting of reefs? Particularly down the west coast of Sumatra, we saw the most incredible uh, results of dynamiting and bombing and removal of reefs. Um, the Sumatrans are using reefs to build their roads and houses, and they've left nothing. There's just rubble left, um, a few pieces of algal-coloured skeleton um, scattered along the bottom, no fish, no life, nothing. The, um, I've never seen anything like it. Coral reefs are threatened and endangered on a planetary scale. Mined, polluted, robbed of life or simply dying, offering nothing but a bleached skeleton where once there was colour and life. What are your observations, ladies? I, mean, I guess in the Red Sea, uh, certainly this part of the world. Well, I was amazed by the bleaching here in Bali. It was incredible. I've never seen a reef with so many corals that were bleached. Corals bleach when water becomes clean. Nagy, all right, check the oil, check the tank is full of diesel, check the oil level in the high pressure pump and make sure everything is in the black barrel, okay? All right. And uh, laser, we need one radio, charged radio. Okay. Do we have uh, lashings in the boat? No lashings. Okay, we have one. Yes, we have a lashing. You have the head? Yep. Okay, Nate. Let I it go. This far. We will be in the water for uh, approximately five hours. Do you have tea, coffee, food? Do you need us to bring food for lunch for you? Uh, yeah, Anna, Anna sets up some snacks, so we're going to have coffee, tea, water, apples, bananas. <laughs> Corals trap a historic record of ocean conditions in their skeleton. The team are drilling through several hundred years of history. The core sample will reveal a record of temperature and rainfall. The cores are surprisingly fragile, handled with care as they are labelled and identified. Okay? Yeah. Give me an extension. Oh, nice. Nice right. to be an extension. Okay, that is 59.2. Date, time, 11.10. And then they are packed off to a laboratory in Southern California. in on biologists at the Scripps Institute of Oceanography in La Jolla. 
she will ask, has global warming been the cause of so much death of corals? The answer may lie in the cause she's delivering from Bali. A slice is taken from a core two to three hundred years old. Drilling into the core at Mark, the death of coral is most often a local problem and demands a local solution. Once a protecting reef is destroyed, used for construction materials, homes and beaches are at risk of being swept away by the ocean. The small fishing community of Ahmed realized that damage to its reef must stop or their very livelihood would be threatened. They came up with a novel idea. Thank you. The community now charge a local tax to visiting tourists who wish to dive. Gay was introduced to the village headman, Jing Suata, by Balinese scientist Ketut Sajana Putra. Tell me about your artificial reefs. You have, uh, you're creating a whole artificial structure off the coast here? They are using the taxes to create an artificial reef. <laughs> He figured out there's about 51 concrete blocks underwater as we set up. Right out here are 51 just concrete all, blocks. All about this, 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 this sort of coastal areas mm -hmm. here. But he, he mentioned he says the, the, the impact is very good for the fish itself here. Yeah. Yeah. Within four.
Goeiedag beste kijkers. Op dit moment heb ik een klein papiertje voor me en dat gaat over Biosfeer 2. Ik weet niet of u het zich nog kunt herinneren, in de negentige jaren zijn er in Amerika een, een aantal uh, biosfeers gemaakt, Biosfeer 1 en Biosfeer 2, waarin acht uh, uh, researchers zich hebben teruggetrokken om te kijken hoe het leven op aarde zou kunnen zijn als wij in... geschreven over deze ecological engineering noemen ze het en uh, u kunt dat even bekijken en vandaag hebben wij in de studio twee van de researchers twee van de van de researchers hier foundation ik ga ze even aan u voorstellen we doen het gesprek in engels ze komen uit amerika en mark komt uit belgië uh, we gaan eens praten met ze over hoe dit project is ontstaan en wat het project eigenlijk uh, inhield. Welkom in de studio. Thank you. Gay Allen is sitting next to me and Mark Thilo. Um, Biosphere 1 en 2. Who wants to take the lead? How did it start? Why is there Biosphere 1 and why is there Biosphere 2? Well, Biosphere 1 is the Earth's biosphere. That's the living entity, the rocks, the soils, the plants, the atmosphere of our biosphere. And Biosphere 2 was a miniature world under glass. It was 3.15 acres, designed to be a global uh, laboratory for ecological studies of the planet, of the biosphere. So it was called Biosphere 2. Okay. Okay. Here we are. Biosphere 2. What, what, what was your experience, Mark? You were a technical, you took part of the technical... Yes, I was in charge of the technical systems. Yeah. And uh, so because we had a totally enclosed system, uh, we needed to control our temperature, our atmosphere. Mm -hmm. We actually had to regenerate our atmosphere. We had a small little ocean in there that had its own wave systems mm -hmm. through a vacuum chamber. Uh, there was 120 pumps in there cycling 200,000 gallons of fresh water, mm -hmm. a million gallons of salt water. So all those processes that normally happen in Biosphere 1 naturally, right. we mimicked to help the uh, 3,200 species to flourish. We had a rainforest, a desert, mm -hmm. savanna, the ocean, and a little city because it was also a biome where eight people lived and we had the uh, big kitchen in there with a uh, dining room, we had a library. Yeah. Uh, so, w but why did, what was the context of it? I mean, Biosphere 2 and 1 have been erased to reserve or preserve species on this earth. Or how, how did this whole process came about? Well, one of the original ideas that sort of pioneered Biosphere 2 was an idea of ecotechnics. And in fact, the Institute of Ecotechnics in London was very, um, very on the forefront of this, advising on, on how to do Biosphere 2. The idea of ecotechnics is to bring together ecology and technology. And right. at a time on our planet when technology is with a very uh, definite course, and in some cases, often in, in cases, it's in the destruction of ecology. Right. And at the same time, ecology is something we can never go back to the Garden of Eden. So this idea was to bring together these two forces of ecology and technology mm -hmm. in a new way, in a harmonious way, where technology would be harnessed for the use of ecology, of, of good living, of uh, recycling air, of wastewater, of water, of growing agriculture, of growing foods without chemicals and pesticides, of, mm -hmm. of living in an international team of people in a, in a harmonious way that really set a direction for our millennium, really. Right, right. That could be applied directly back to planet Earth and at the same time study these cycles and how does a complex ecological system really work, mm -hmm. which before Bias for Two there is never a laboratory so tightly sealed that one could do such studies. Right. So what, what, what came out of this? I mean, after all this research, you spent two years in captivity, so to say. <laughs> so w what were the foundings? I mean, what were your foundings? Well, well, there was many. First of all, that we proved the concept that one can make a, uh, sy a closed system, yeah. soil-based system. We grew, in the two years, we grew 80% of our food. The next crew 
uh, grew grew the full hundred percent. We had an agriculture system. You did it. You did it yourself. You grew yes, the food the yourself. Yes, eight people inside. So yeah. the whole the whole idea was that you had to. How did you do it with meat, for example? You grew your own food. Did you had animals inside? Oh yes, we had uh, we had goats and chickens. Mm -hmm. um, and so also for milk and milk uh, and uh, eggs, mm -hmm. but. Um, the agriculture system was so small at uh, 20,000 square feet for eight people. It was 15% more efficient than any agriculture system on the uh, in the world, which is also in in this book the actual numbers of our harvests. Yeah. Um, the uh, we had to recycle all of our own water, so the water we started with in the beginning of the two years was still that same water cycling oh, through okay. as we used it uh, to drink our cup of coffee it would go in through the agriculture it would end up in the uh, fog uh, uh, desert so it had the water kept recycling was very successful uh, and we did not pollute our atmosphere our atmosphere was still breathable and the only thing that, an interesting thing that happened, because the system was there so were no closed. There were no cars in there. Huh? There were no cars. <laughs> not, not, so not then. Then anyway. it was easy. Yeah. <laughs> um, okay. So the, yeah. uh, but uh, the oxygen dropped yeah. because there was a process called uh, uh, CO2, uh, carbonization. Yeah. The CO2 was sequestered in the concrete. Yeah. And so the oxygen was tied up. Therefore, dropped to we let it drop to 14.2 percent, just to see what would happen, uh, yeah. and then of course injected after in 14 months we put the oxygen back to 19 percent. So how how uh, did you cope with that, the oxygen dropping so rapidly? I mean there was no replacement. You didn't fill it up to 100 percent, so to say. I mean so how how did you cope with that? Well, it is. Uh, it's it's almost like uh, climbing mountains. When you get up there at fifteen thousand feet, you get short yeah, breath. breath. Some people get headaches, mm -hmm. and it's very different individual who has problems or not. Mm -hmm. uh, but it always feels like you're climbing those last hundred feet of a mountain. So as you walk up the stairs, uh, yeah. But still, it, it was. But w was that also a problem because there was not enough green circulation? There was not enough. I mean, because the oxygen is being helped by the green and the ocean also, isn't it? I mean, we in get oxygen from the ocean also. In, in fact, the, uh, the plants were producing the oxygen to breathe. That wasn't the problem at all. But it became a, an intense study of interest because mm -hmm. humans can live at lower levels of oxygen. Right now, you're breathing, I'm breathing 21% oxygen. Yeah. And what our studies show, that at least down to 17 or even maybe 16%, Humans can function very rigorously and well, so mm -hmm. that means submarines can operate at lower level oxygen, it means space stations can, it means mm -hmm. the shuttle can. So we had uh, participants from, from these different uh, industries also coming to the biosphere to find out about it because they were fascinated that we were living as if we were on a high mountain of, let's say, Tibet, uh, like people do there, and operating well, mm -hmm. which means that we can also right. really change uh, how we live elsewhere on this planet. Right. Right. It, it really opened up the whole atmosphere studies, opened up whole avenues of new uh, sort of interest in how we live and, and what we're breathing. For example, if you get in a subway of London or Amsterdam, you will be breathing very high levels of carbon dioxide, and yet the mm -hmm. average person doesn't, isn't aware of this. Mm -hmm. but, mm -hmm. uh, but atmospheres change dramatically mm -hmm. depending where you are mm -hmm. on the Earth. Mm -hmm. They're like little echo niches right. within certain environments. Like say in the studio, for example, we really don't have any idea, but there is quite a change to mm -hmm. say outside or, mm -hmm. or anywhere mm -hmm. else. So to come back on the food situation, because I'm quite interested, how did you uh, nourish yourself? You had to grow your own vegetables, you had to kill your own animals, or did you? Yes, okay. and uh, most of our uh, staples were uh, bananas, we had bananas every day, papayas, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, a lot of uh, sweet potatoes, mm -hmm. uh, then of course they all the vegetables. They were growing well. <laughs> they were growing very, those were growing, and, and red beets, they were growing oh, really yeah. well, yes. Okay. And then of course we had tomatoes and lettuce and uh, onions and uh, rice, uh, wheat. Mm -hmm for our occasional bread. Uh, in the tropical uh, agriculture, we also had uh, coffee. 
over uh, but the coffee everything was still small because it was the beginning of the system it was designed for a hundred years yeah so our coffee trees we had uh, but what was it? Forty-eight cups of coffee in the two years' time, oh, right. so, which was <laughs> okay. so uh, we got a real treat. Huh? Yeah, yes, put a smile on everybody's <laughs> face uh, that that day. That Here morning. we come with the coffee again. Yes, yeah. um, it, was, it was like a farm. Yeah. If, uh, exactly, right. living on a farm where you had to. But the only difference was in that regard was everything was measured and recyclable, mm -hmm. so y y there was no away. Mm -hmm. You knew where your water went to and what was in it and how to bring it back. You knew what how to bring your what was in your compost and how to recycle it at the right time. And there was all the time the right. phasing right. and the the spatial uh, changes was extremely important. And so we were farmers yet at the same time we were living in a very futuristic way mm -hmm. of measuring in detail so many things and then trying to balance it in a way or recycle right. it correctly in a way mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. was bringing together these uh, two forces in, in a new way. Mm -hmm. So now you're sitting there with eight people. I mean, everybody has, I mean, it was in a way some luxury because everybody had his own space and his own bedroom and it was not like you were put together and you had to deal with each other the whole day through. But you go in with eight people, you know each other reasonably well because I heard you've been working on this project for quite some time before you went in. So how what kind of conflicts did you encounter by living and working on that level with each other? Well, there, there was many and, and uh, in many ways they were not different than any other conflicts you would get in, uh, let's say, an office or, or, or a company situation, right. except that uh, it was so intensified because we weren't the only ones looking at it. There mm -hmm. was from the outside there was a lot of people looking at it too not with camera but more as an interest mm -hmm. uh, and uh, but to me it was fascinating because it was sort of a time a two-year time I had a time to study myself as well as mm -hmm. everybody else how do I work with social relationships and and uh, right so what, what what did came out what came out for you I mean can you open up a little bit to that yeah, uh, well, actually, really, uh, is... I mean, what were your conflicts? My, my conflicts was that, what I really realized, I think, is that you can't really change anybody else. How much you want another person to change, it will not happen. So the only thing is, I make that change, or, you know, I, or I decide I will live with it. Mm -hmm. uh, and that's really the only thing, but which was very profound. I mean, it's easy to say, but but why is there two sort of? Uh, but there were all reasonable people in that sense. I mean, it was not a murderer with it, you know. Which, for example, yes. you did not have to be afraid that there was some killer in there whom you <laughs> really had to. I mean, no there were a reasonable anyway, a physical yeah. killer, you know, <laughs> or maybe that kind of feelings came up or out. I don't know, but yeah. Um, so you came to the conclusion you can't change anybody, okay? So, but how did you cope with it? How did you cope with the fact that you can't change someone? How, what happened? Well, so then, so then the change is within myself. I mean, okay, your I attitude. To, yeah. Yes, my attitude that, and and uh, huh. how I would live with that, uh, which is not easy. I mean, to <laughs> accept that either. I mean, it's not. But but still. Right. And conflict is, and the other thing is, you can't get away from conflict. Conflict is part of that humanity. So, so um, I guess I accepted that. Where before, maybe Biosphere 2, I was still thinking very naively, uh, yeah. it's not part of me. It wasn't it's not there part of me or part of, of, of you. Of, uh -huh. you know, but it is. Were there counselors inside also? Were there what? be any way of some conflict resolution. There was counselors on the outside because it was a scientific scrutinized project and so we went through a series of tests on the outside to make sure that right. it wasn't just subjective that we're all well, we were in fact all well. Mm -hmm. And uh, But I, I think again to the, the conflict that this was, for me the insight was it was a major um, insight on struggles that occur inside bias for two or outside that they're sent they're based on value on, on really value decisions mm -hmm. and in that regard uh, they w 
it was almost microscoped in Biosphere 2 what those values are, but they're, they're very basic, such as um, do you want to uh, focus on a total system or a biosphere, or do you want to focus on a very single ele- a, a point of research? Mm-hmm. And these are things that go on on our own society, and mm-hmm. yet in Biosphere 2 they became and, and very important. And so the struggles mm-hmm. were, were based from, from really that point. For you at that point. Definitely. Yeah, I mean, yeah. 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 Hmm. And a way to uh, try and work around that um, is, is something that we're, we're working on right now, Mark and I, with a ship, because this was the center, the area of Bias for Two that was the most challenging, was, was the people side of it and how people work together. Mm-hmm. So we're working with a ship now to try and bring in different cultures to see how people can work just not on a task, professionally but also socially Mm -hmm. and the more different cultures that we bring together on the ship the easier it is and I think that's the most interesting thing that's happened in the past few years since Vice for Two is that cultural diversity is a really a way Mm -hmm. to heal or to harmonize um, uh, but in passes. Yeah, yeah. But there were some. There were different nationalities in biosphere too, wasn't it? Yeah. I mean, so you had to already work with that cultural differences. Yes, and and that's true. We had three different nationalities, and we had four men and four women, and we had vastly different ages, from thirty to sixty-five, mm-hmm. and that played a very important role, and, and extremely. It, that was really what showed also the the insight into how um, it, it's. Um, the, the planetary work that I think all of us are really looking at now is is this um, cultural exchange and, and how to be a planetary mm-hmm. citizen. Right. And if it had been more diverse, it would have been easier. But there were still many more Americans than the Belgian representative, Mark, mm-hmm. or the, the um, British representatives. Right, right. If we had even less Americans and more of, let's say, an Asian or a Japanese right. or a Chinese, but something vastly different, it would have made a big difference. Yeah, a it big, would confront it. It at least it, it could f- could had confronted you as an American much more with your own cultural background. Yes, yes. You know, Now you were still in a dominating position. So yes, exactly. Taking the rights towards yourself. You know. Yes. And that idea of complexity, like in the species, we had three thousand, uh, over three thousand different species in there. Uh, Which range from insects from tropical to uh, insects to micro- microbes all the way to okay. plants and, and animals. There were also uh, the small, tiny galagos in there. Um, I don't know the what little, these are. It's a, the monkey. little little monkeys. Uh, the, okay. Yeah, it's small. Yeah. And um, there was a snake in there. There was a tortoise in there, or or two. Usually, always in sets. Uh, yeah. Um, it's like the ship of Ark. Or <laughs> yeah. Well, if you think about it, I guess the simplest way to think about bias for two in that experiment is for two years, eight people left this world. Yeah. And it's just that simple in that we were breathing a dim- different atmosphere, we were drinking very different water that had been recycled in certain ways, and we were eating food grown totally organically without mm-hmm. any pe- chemicals or pesticides. We didn't have sugar. We didn't have... Um, uh, wine or beer, we didn't have uh, a lot of fat and a lot mm-hmm. of cakes, mm-hmm. and and we uh, made some. We made uh, some banana wine when there was yeah, yeah, plenty. Yeah. And also, the system was so young that over years you would create a surplus, mm-hmm. which we have right mm-hmm. now in, in but many places. But did you like? Uh, were you? notified yourself like how to make your food how to for example the recipes or did you really started to dig into that I mean, we what dug kind into of it you dig into it yeah. dug into it yeah. huh. and a cookbook uh, actually sally silverstone who was in charge of food systems uh-huh. uh, did write a cookbook with all the ingredients oh, and great. we yeah. would send out the recipes outside and <laughs> they would say no 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 this can't be in the mm. cookbook or the, it was hard for them to because we were not using butter or mm-hmm. things like that which mm-hmm. sometimes makes it hard to yeah you had to be very very creative mm-hmm. and start relying on sweet potatoes and bananas for the sweeteners mm-hmm. and and I mean a completely different way of life mm-hmm. that was um, uh, very purifying very I might, I might yes. feel so very. very purifying well across the board the doctor said we were more healthy when we came out than when we went in so sure. yeah. or cholesterol okay. All levels dropped. Sure. Uh, sure. Blood so, w- were you all friends? Were there couples into it? Were they all authentic, or were they all individuals, females and males? I mean, how did that uh, whole 
attraction and magnifying part of, of plus and minus went on. I mean, were there couples? Were there all loose friends? Or how did it go? How did you work with that? Oh, well, there's a person. Yeah, so, well, there was eight, eight individuals in there, of course, but yeah, couples. Uh, in fact, uh, one couple got married right after. Oh, right. I think about six months, uh, Tabor and Jane get married. They formed a couple during the, couple. the two years. And yeah, yeah. Yes. Uh, and many lasting friendships, like Gay and mm, myself. Right. Uh, well, that much, you're so close to oh, each other. Oh, yeah. I mean, yeah. So you would eat together every day, you would have your tasks to do? What that was interesting with eating together because we had a. Uh, set up like a French cafe with different tables and people could take their food to the bal we had a balcony over looking the agriculture yeah. but for some reason everybody was always attracted although whatever conflicts were happening to come around this table at, uh, at, dinner time. at the end of the day at dinner time yeah. uh -huh. and uh, mm. of course uh, breakfast was always together because we would have our meeting there mm. and look at the priorities of the day, see what needed to be done mm. to keep our system going. Mm. But it was interesting that everybody always showed up for dinner, just to... Mm. Mm. There was a definite attraction. Attraction yeah. to, at least with AIDS, you have to have some company. Yeah. So h how much time did you work? I mean, how much sleep did you get? We what got was a fair amount. Of we basically worked <coughs> at least an eight-hour day, and, and the working involved anywhere from being farmers to being scientists and looking at the day, what's in your atmosphere mm -hmm. and then what you might have to do mm -hmm. about it in order mm -hmm. to change it slightly mm -hmm. or to cooking to um, communicating with the outside world and then we also had movies and books we had a library mm -hmm. and we had telephone and email and fax and uh, meetings mm -hmm. we could meet at the glass and exchange so it was quite a well-rounded healthy life and mm -hmm. we, we slept at least eight hours a day and then okay, get up early and right. carry on so, but now the whole thing, I mean, this was a project set up for 100 years, I just heard. Yes. Mm. So it stopped after two years. I mean, the purpose was to go in for two years, that was the commitment, mm -hmm. or the commitment was longer, five years, four years? No, it was a two-year commitment. It was a two-year commitment. But then we had a five-month transition that yeah. we kept closed and put a new crew in after five months with seven people. Okay. And they stayed in for about six months. Uh, it wasn't a true closure anymore, but mm -hmm. uh, then um, Columbia University uh, took over research and uh, w what they really did, the first thing they did was then take the people out, take the agriculture out, the most efficient agriculture mm -hmm. system in, this, in the world, okay. use pesticides, uh, petrochemical pesticides, uh, put in a car, <coughs> where oh. you said we didn't have a car inside. Right. At the, the, uh, so it, um, they okay, totally so changed the direction back to their line of research. But what was actually their research? I mean, where were they getting at then? I mean, you guys came from actually a natural-based uh, agriculture way of living while well, they take over and put in pesticides. I don't understand, what? I mean, suddenly, what were, what were their objectives? Uh, I mean, you guys were trying to find some alternatives. A, bio, bi a biospheric you know, approach. We were right, using, yeah. trying to find alternatives. And what are what were they trying to do? Our, I mean. our approach was very definitely really um, addressing a taboo, which I think is really a planetary taboo of the human is not a part of the biosphere or not part of the, bi of the environment. Mm -hmm. And so oftentimes academics particularly will take the human out of the equation and just not even look at it. So we were really looking at the whole biosphere with the technology, with the human humanity mm -hmm. force included, as well as the life involved with it. Colombia has an approach, much more traditional and classic, in that they're looking at biogeochemical cycling, how does, how does things cycle, molecule mm -hmm. cycle, um, global warming, very specific points of issue that they, they mm -hmm. want to address. Mm -hmm. So it's a completely different si viewpoint. Mm -hmm. It goes back to the, the values of what I was saying was a, a classic right. a, okay. a battle inside the biosphere, inside and outside, was whether or not you want to address something from a biospheric view or right. whether you just want to not and go to something very specific when in fact both can go hand in hand and that's naturally the way they sh it should occur mm -hmm. but it tends to um, fracture out where only one view is, is taken right. and what we were really trying to do was to do it all 
and to bring mm -hmm. it the, all both fused mm -hmm. together in mm -hmm. a new way. So you, eight people, some people went to Columbia University, uh, got stuck there, and you took another approach. I mean, there were some very valuable projects in Biosphere 2. So what did you do with that project? I mean, what is left over? What is being actually being practicized at this particular moment with all the knowledge you have gained over those two years? Yeah. Well, well, Biosphere 2 was was only possible because of uh, Institute of Ecotechnics who did the uh, all the science for Biosphere 2 mm -hmm. has many projects around the world like a uh, savanna in in Western Australia doing research on savannas that's yeah. where the whole the idea of a savanna uh, we have a ocean going ship uh, looking now at coral reefs um, mm -hmm. which we say uh, right now is uh, been done for five years we found out as we, we developed a technique to looking at health using video camera in the ocean of Biosphere 2 looking at the coral reef. We wanted to apply that to Biosphere 1, the Earth, but found out there is nobody really knows exactly where the reef is, how much reef there is. Mm -hmm. So our first task uh, we set out to do is map that coral reef of the planet. And so our ship, the Heraclitus, is going around and taking transects of reef, looking at their health and vitality. Mm -hmm. We're also taking uh, very small samples to look at uh, uh, climate uh, changes mm -hmm. and, and temperature. Mm -hmm. We take temperature data. Um, mm -hmm. So what so you do is really make an inventory, are you making an inventory of the global condition at this particular moment? Is oh, that what's still going on? It's oh. like an inventory of... Well, what we found with Biosphere 2 was that the coral reef was the most sensitive part. Mm -hmm. And that would show immediately any interaction with the atmosphere. Right. So therefore, then we found out that Biosphere 1 coral reefs were... Is, they're not very studied. In fact, li mm -hmm. like I said, we don't know where they are. So yes, to start with an inventory, but at the same... And at the same time, look at their condition and their health. Uh, and and what is what is the uh, the antidote? I mean, looking at their condition and their health. I mean, so what is it now in your experience? What have you been learned to heal, to harmonize? Because it's been getting pretty out of harmony. We all know that. So how what are we going to do now to harmonize? And what is the technical or? Uh, uh, inventory you have made over all those years to apply I, this? I think the approach, uh, the only possible approach and one that we're trying to pioneer is to put information out, mm -hmm. just like this TV channel. Mm -hmm. And that in that way is, is the only chance to try and get enough people even to see there's a problem. So okay. we're working with an international team of people, one, to provide a, a seamanship program where students from all over the world, anywhere, can come to our ship mm -hmm. um, and join a nine-month program there and learn about the coral reefs, learn about how to, to assess their health and vitality, how to live on a ship at sea, how to live with other people. Mm -hmm. And at the same time, so that's the local level, at the same time we're working with some scientists um, internationally to design a sensor that we're hoping to be put up on a space station or on a satellite in the near future which could actually see coral reefs from space and so you get a planetary view and mm -hmm. this comes back to the biosphere of the mm -hmm. necessity to see coral reefs from a global viewpoint mm -hmm. one to know where they are and then two to find out well what is happening to coral reefs because we really have no idea mm -hmm. uh, only by a few what, observations. What is their influence? What is the influence of a coral reef on the biosphere? In particular, we think one main influence is simply the fact that they're like an indicator biome. They're the area of the world that we saw in Biosphere 2, which yeah. responds instantly. Mm -hmm. So if the coral reef is healthy, we have the indicator of the ocean around it. If it's not healthy, that's an indication that the, the ocean around it is not well. So one, it's definitely a signpost. It's, it's a main way to, to address health issues. And the second and third and fourth could be anywhere from um, uh, an oxygen generator, a carbon dioxide sink, mm -hmm. 
to pharmaceuticals to it's a very diverse uh, the, the amount of species in a, in a coral reef also again have not been counted yet. but wait a minute I mean uh, what I find interesting in this I mean I really must stretch this a little bit <laughs> I mean so we look at the coral reefs and they are an indicator of how healthy the ocean is and how healthy actually the planet is because if the ocean is unhealthy we also have the indication that our planet is not very healthy and so we we have this kind of layer upon layer um, but we look around and we will see already I mean you went into biosphere 2 you came out healthier than when you went That's in That's true. so there is the indication already of course that the health you know the way you have been living in biosphere 2 the the uh, um, purity, I might say, huh, of living somehow made you much healthier. So the indication is already there. What is health and what is not healthy? Yes, but not on a not on a day by day basis. And, and it's mm -hmm. one step farther. It's like if there's okay. trouble, you can immediately see it, and then you can try to source where the trouble originated from. And right now we're guessing a lot, and we're guessing because we don't even know enough about our own planet to understand it's how it functions as a biosphere. Mm -hmm. And the coral reefs are definitely How important. The interactions in that, really yes, are. and that what is the source of a problem and where is it coming from in order to really act intelligently, which okay. I think is the task of humanity for the millennium, is to become an intelligent co-creator with this okay. biosphere entity. Then we need the information, and that's that goes back to then trying to even know where they are. What are coral reefs? What are they doing? And it's just a small piece of the big puzzle. Right. Not the all, it's not the answer to everything. Okay. <laughs> no, 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 I know what you're saying. <laughs> how, how do you manage We're them? doing our best. <laughs> We're trying to find the answers in interaction. So what do you say? You yeah, it's like a, a managing tool, how to, how to manage them. For example, yeah. in Indonesia, there's a lot of dynamiting. Yeah. And there's people uh, coming in, dynamiting reef, harvest the fish, okay. and the, the fishing villages on the outside, that's the end of their... Total ignorance. Yeah. So, so, so by, by also, we're, we're at the same time pioneering, it's not just our ship going around, we're also wanting a satellite yeah. that could monitor those reefs and give immediate feedback to... Uh, to the people really out there. But how do you make them this consciousness? I mean, you're putting dynamite in and, you know, know. blowing. I mean, th this is a point where you come. I mean, is that our task? We know, I mean, this is not a yeah. good thing to put dynamite in. Huh? You know, you can kind of intelligently think about this. So, how do you stretch that to someone who lives on this island? and says, well, you know, I need to get my fish. I don't care how I get it, but I'm just going to get it. You know, how do you, that, that, that step, I mean, I know as a ship, because you're also trying to, how do you live with people? Huh? How do you communicate with each other? How do you get into real conflict resolving? Because that's also part of it. How do we all get the piece of the pie? Because that's what we want. He needs his fish, which mm -hmm. is obvious, mm -hmm. you know, and we know it's not good how he gets his fish. So what is the alternative? You know, so yeah, the, and, that, the and, and to show those alternatives, and that's part of, and that's what why the internet is really interesting because this information can go out, uh, is to to really educate people that if you blast once, that's yeah. the end of your fish for 50, for 60, maybe a hundred years, okay. while otherwise, if you maintain the reef, you have a steady right. income of fish, and of course, it it, it isn't maybe. your one-time big harvest. Uh, right, so I think that's a good one you say. It's not a one-time big harvest, so the learning process of you don't have to get it all at once, but if you be intelligent, you can stretch it a lot longer. I, mean, I think you have it on all, all levels, I mean in business too. You see the prices people nowadays charge for consulting or whatever they do, it's outrageous. You know, it's like everybody wants to have it once. I want to have that million in one time. Mm -hmm. So then I don't have to do anything anymore. It's a kind of mentality. Mm -hmm. you now, while if you ask uh, a little bit, uh, just reasonable, so we can all sustain ourselves, you know, we can have a steady economy and we yes, all have Yes, if we manage our, our planet and our resources, <coughs> there's no way say you can't use a resource you can use the resource right. but make it so where it doesn't destroy 
uh, right. your wealth yeah. within it because it really is and, and that's the other thing I, I learned out of Biosphere too is how to lead a wealthy life and wealth became of the things we grew the things we produced mm -hmm. and uh, with our own resources right. and that was uh, so that this big difference between wealth and say richness or, or meaning basically meaning money there is a yeah. big yeah. you know you could have a million dollars in the bank but live very unwealthy <coughs> very, very poor very poorly right. yes and right. uh, so how is the uh, how is the backup how is the support you people having I mean to me it sounds very intelligently and very uh, with a lot of integrity and you know that's how it feels to me but what is the backup in the outside world how do you how do you get your money how, do, how is it how is the support going on here um, which we, you know which uh, parties are willing Greenpeace are they willing to support I mean who is supporting this we are a nonprofit which means that everybody is a volunteer and it's a constant source of, of help we need help Generally. And we ask help from individuals, from uh, corporations and in-kind donations. Um, to keep a ship at sea, we're probably um, one of the few people in the world able to do it at uh, about $300 a day, which is incredibly low. But uh, but that's a constant cash we need. Mm -hmm. And so we're, we're always out there looking, trying to get support. Mm -hmm. So, But there is support out there, in, and especially... Uh, uh, we've been at ports like in Gada, <coughs> in Egypt, in Oman, India, Sri Lanka, um, Maldives, Seychelles, uh, Sumatra, uh, all, all through Indonesia, Kenya, and almost in every port we have gotten support mm -hmm. where we could stay, dock, uh, or, or uh, dock fees would be waived. Little things like that, right. but that are helpful because we okay. have to, otherwise you would have to come up with the cash. Right. Um, right. So that, uh, in that respect, there is a lot of people backing, uh, backing there's a lot of individuals. Uh, our our uh, intent in this next year is to put on our homepage, www.pcrf.org, our data. Yeah, and I, our I will write that in uh, on the screen. Yeah. Great, and our our, our um, visual imaging. What we want to do is make it a um, a center for the world, mm -hmm. where the ship is the eyes mm -hmm. of the sea, and puts it up for people anywhere to have access to. Mm -hmm. um, that on a local scale, we think we can do this year. It's just a matter of getting it right so we can get everything that we collect mm -hmm. online. But then to expand that in the next few years, so then with the satellite imaging, if we get to that point, then it becomes also a global look. Mm -hmm. And we feel that if, if we succeed in this, then the eyes of the ocean are the world's eyes, mm -hmm. and that that's a step mm -hmm. in the right direction. Mm -hmm. It's, again, much like what you're trying with mm -hmm. your TV station to do here, is to get information available. Right. And uh, so that's where we're hoping to go with this. And, and have it as a, a real experiment whereby then it will be picked up for other things, rainforests, cult vanishing mm -hmm. cultures, uh, all right. the numerous problems that we face, that it would be an example for how this can be um, utilized for the world yeah. uh, in, in many areas. So a lot to be learned for all of us still. Hmm? Oh, I definitely think so, okay. yeah. Always. Always. Yeah. <laughs> a lot to be learned, so there needs to be openness to uh, explore this. Okay, thank you both. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. We know how much it matters. 2.5 trillion dry tons at present with an annual productivity of 150 to 200 million tons, including 18 million tons of human flesh, depositing an annual increase of 10 million tons to geological deposits, coal, oil, limestones. Science shows we are ephemera, plucking subtlest inner octaves of structure from super strings of galaxies anchored in a void of infinite potential. <laughs> <laughs>